thank you for joining us for the Impact 30 webinar. We are going to do our best to impart some expertise and knowledge with you today. Um, we, we do our best to uh, spontaneously have music interrupt a, a, a little bit of dialogue, which is totally fine, because today we're going to cover a different business excellence topic um, to help you survive, grow, and thrive. My name is David King. Um, I'm one of our regional directors here at Impact Utah. Uh, today's topic is a bit unique. So as, as the recession looms, we are seeking to provide some expertise and support in really three main categories right now. The first is to focus on your core products by allowing you to do more with less. And, and that type of thing can be achieved through focusing on lean skills and processes. The second is to double down on your internal leadership so that your employees can develop a vision of excellence and inspire others to achieve it. The last is to grow your top line revenue. Our presentation today will focus on just that. During the presentation, if anyone has any technical difficulties, please reach out to us using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Additionally, if you have any questions, I encourage you to submit those using the Q&A feature within Zoom. We will work to answer those during or after the presentation. Our presenter today is Wynne Jeanfro. Wynne is our executive director here at Impact Utah and has over 30 years of experience in starting, guiding, and developing companies. Throughout his professional career, Wynne has repeatedly demonstrated his ability to identify opportunity, gather appropriate resources, and successfully grow companies. As an entrepreneur, who has started 12 companies and sold eight of them, Win knows the perils of starting and running a business. The financial pressure that exists, the operational nightmares that pop up, and the ruthless competitors that never go away. I cannot think of a better individual to share his expertise with us today on, on finding ways and identifying methods to grow your revenue. And with that, Win, I will pass the time over to you. David, thank you for the introduction, uh, and glad to have you all here. Uh, as David mentioned, uh, I've been through uh, the you know dark night of the soul, where you wonder where all the money is going to come from to cover payroll the next day. Uh, I've been through economic cycles that have been troubling, including a couple of recessions. And as the economy begins to spin, you know, kind of skid a little bit sideways, uh, I thought it would be helpful for us, uh, particularly business owners that might be joining us, um, to examine the things that are kind of the foundation for our success. And that, uh, as David, you said rightly, you know, there's an operational piece. I, I learned early on that I make my profit in my operations. And if I don't understand how to operationally run my business profitably, I put myself out of business. <clears throat> what I also found out is that I get put out of business by my competition if I really don't understand marketing, if I don't understand uh, how I go about the process of clearly identifying problems that I'm solving, how I do it uniquely with a compelling value proposition. And so today we're going to, like you said, David, skip the rock really on the surface of very deep topics. But this is a, a time that you ought to be looking at, you know, like you said, Dave, um, when, when we look at operational excellence, we look at leadership and whether or not we're the kind, we have the skill set, the soft sk leadership skill sets to be able to help guide our company during this troubling time. First and foremost, we need to be guiding them through the process of, um, you know, being able to sell what we make, whether it's a good or a service that we deliver. And these 12 questions are the foundation for that process. So <clears throat> I want to talk with that, uh, begin right out of the shoot with the first three of the 12 questions. The first is, you know, what problem am I solving in the market? And if you find that your sales are, are beginning to, to drop off a little bit, one of the things you'd be, you should be asking yourself is, am I still solving a problem that's relevant in the market? Uh, what I found is that if I want a big business, I solve a big problem. If I want a small business, I solve a small problem. Uh, as a business owner and as a founder, I found that it was about the same amount of energy to grow and, you know, a small enterprise as opposed to growing something that was multiple millions of dollars in revenue and in value. And so good time to ask, is the, is the problem that I went into business with still in existence in the, in the market? Or is this a legacy declining demand for something that is uh, for which another solution has been developed? 
The next is how am I unique? And, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides coming up uh, because it, it really matters. And then what value proposition do I offer that's compelling to the individual that has the problem that I solve? And there's going to be a, you know, a reference just below that. You can read the pain price threshold. We'll get into that a little bit in, in a little bit more detail in, in, in uh, the future slides coming up. But when it comes to the very first problem part is what so problem am I solving and how am I solving uniquely is at the heart of success in business. And, and to, to you know, reiterate that, that the, the significance of it, if I were to ask all of you what toothpaste fights cavities, 93% of you say Crest fights cavities. And it does. It turns out it has the clinical uh, amount of fluoride in it that has proven to be a, an, an anti-cavity impact. Anti -cavity impact. If, if I were to ask you what Colgate does, well, many of you would recognize that their focus is wider teeth. In fact, it's even on the Colgate logo, there's a big bright star to the right that indicates bright smiles. If I were to ask you which of those um, ubiquitous products, products we find in, in every one of our bathrooms, gives us fresher breath, most of you would say Aquafresh. And the reason I bring that something as, as common as toothpaste up is that if you look at all of them, they all have the clinical amount of fluoride to be able to fight cavities. But the reason that each one of those focuses on a different niche, a different mind share, is that you realize that Crest fights cavities. And as a result, they can't. They can't own that space. Now, uh, to... to kind of drum this in a little bit more. There's another story about, about an automaker. And, um, and I want to have you take a quick quiz. There's a quick poll. I want you to answer in 10 seconds. You're going to list get a list of cars. And I want you in 10 seconds to identify the, the car that is the safest car manufacturer. So it's going to start now. David, I think you're going to put that poll up. That's that right. Correct? I okay, so. have it launched. It's up. Right. <clears throat> you all have 10 seconds. To answer this question, which of these car manufacturers makes the safest automobile? Do it quickly. First impressions. Okay. We've got a few more coming in. I'm going to leave it open for 20 seconds, Win, just to see if we can grab a little more participation. Okay, let's go ahead and stop it. Okay. Know, this is this is, this is these are, you know it's not necessarily statistically uh, yeah. significant based on how many people are here, but you know it's enough that we can at, at least answer the question. So, so uh, as I saw here, most of you said Volvo, and rightly so. Uh, in fact, in 1990, uh, the poll went out um, to consumers in the United States, and 72% of consumers, like you did, uh, answered that Volvo was the safest car manufacturer, or, or manufactured the safest car in the industry. We did so, have when we had we had one vote that in the chat for Honda too, oh. just to just to properly illustrate the results. Okay, well, it, it, Honda. Great, I, you know, I've owned one. I love the Honda. I, I, I've owned their motorcycles. I love their motorcycles. Highly reliable, by the way, and and that's an area that they really own in the in the at least in the motorcycle segment. If you want a, a bike that will start every time you're out in the woods, buy a Honda. <clears throat> but uh, but the safest Volvo, and so you would assume that uh, if Volvo is the safest car, makes the safest car in the industry, then um, you know which one has uh, invented the the lap, the, you know, across the lap seatbelt or the shoulder harness, or the deforming um, uh, 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 you know, steering wheel, or the impact airbag, or the side impact airbag, or the soft dash, so that if we hit it, we don't damage ourselves as much. Crush zones, um, the internal roll cages, anti-lock brakes, heads-up displays. You'd say, oh, of course, Volvo did. Well, it turns out that that that's not the case. Another car manufacturer was the inventor of all of those safety features, and they wanted to go to the U.S. market with a series of, of cars that were small, and they sold lots and lots around the world, but they were known for something else. And so they spent a hundred million dollars in the U.S. market trying to convince U.S. consumers that they were, because they had invented all of those things, the safest car manufacturer in the world. And so like you say, you know, we all we all voted for what we think was true, which is Volvo. But the person, the, the industry that invented all that was was Mercedes, and they ranked number seven in the poll. 
Volvo was number one. And after spending a hundred million dollars in the United States in this big ad campaign, they they grew, they climbed all the way from number seven to number seven. And Volvo tumbled all the way from number one to number one. What we learned is that once we as a consumer have in our minds a certain position for a brand, it's incredibly difficult to change our collective opinions, even if the facts belie what we believe. And I bring that up because, you know, if, if we are in the, in the business of solving a problem for a consumer, and this happens to be our consumer, one, again, as I mentioned before, we put ourselves out of business operationally, but our competitor puts us out of business if we don't understand marketing. Now, I've heard from so many business owners, but when I'm not a marketer, I don't know marketing. Well, I can tell you that if you frame the questions that need to be answered for every business, the way that we're framing them today, you can actually become quite intelligent about how to market. And let's say, for example, that this was your target client. Um, we give our, our personas for our target clients names. In this case, I'll call this guy Chad. But just looking at Chad and what he's doing on this, on this beautiful, now you can do it in April, up in the mountains on this Polaris snowmobile, you can begin to develop a whole narrative about who Chad is, what his age is, where he might live, what he might have in his uh, uh, garage. I mean, clearly he's got motorcycles and wave runners. He might even have a big boat that allows him to, to surf behind the boat during the summer. But you can also look at additional complementary brands, kind of the broader ecosystem of consumer goods that he lives with. One of those would be Fox Boots and, and other apparel. He certainly, we know what he drinks, it's Monster. Uh, we also know that there are other brands that he has great confidence in Mirage and Triple Nine as, <clears throat> as brands that, that are complementary to him. You also know that as a result of the kinds of things that Chad's doing right now, occasionally these exhibitions don't end well. And as a result, Chad occasionally breaks his arm. And, uh, and we can talk about that as a potential example of how we can solve a problem uniquely. If indeed Chad, as a result of this particular stunt, did not land well, well, then one of the things that we ask ourselves is if he does this and he doesn't land well, what are some of the products that I might be in business to sell that Chad might use? And in this case, if he broke his arm, one of the things that I could do is once it's reset is sell slings. And if I happen to be in the sling business, how do I go through those first three questions you know, what problem am I solving? How am I solving it uniquely? What's my value proposition? And in this case, there are 411 sling manufacturers in the, in the United States, according to Google recently. Well, how do I, if I'm going to be 412, do I differentiate myself in the competitive landscape? And one of the ways I could do that is, this is an example. Well, you've, you've injured your arm. And in this case, I could provide you a sling, but you notice that all your buddies that were taking that 8K imagery that's now part of your, you know, your YouTube or not uh, your, of your, uh, of your um, online presence. In this case, instead of having to explain to everybody why your arm's in a sling, they just QR code that baby and it'll take them right to a, a custom built website that has all of your images and all of your video that show you from approach to launch to failure and the aftermath. Um, and, and in fact, in this case, um, I'm going to sell you not just one sling. What you're going to do is because you've got to wear this thing for six weeks, put in order the next five images you want on the, on the front of this now, not sling, but billboard that becomes a billboard for your, the, you know, that you live so much on the edge of life that you occasionally break yourself in the process. And so that what, what is a medical device now becomes something other than a medical device. Although at its core, just like toothpaste fights cavities, <clears throat> this is the fresher breath, the brighter teeth version of something is again, ubiquitous as a sling. So once you've come up with a unique solution to a, to a meaningful problem, hopefully a big problem, and, it's, uh, and, and the value that you're able to deliver it operationally to the market is compelling to your, to your consumer, then you go to the next set of questions. How do I help the chads of the world become aware of my solution? How do I get them to gain confidence in my brand? How do I get them to try my brand, to buy my brand, to repeat the process? In this case, you know, he's going to wreck on the motorcycle. He's going to probably do something on the Wave Runner that would have 
you know, um, non-intended outcomes? And then how do I get them, if I'm really intelligent, to refer me into their circle of influence so that the people taking, you know, his posse will, th that are also doing the same kinds of things, will come in and, and utilize, you know, my solution as well. But let's, let's march down this, this, these, these six questions very quickly around awareness, confidence, try by, repeat, refer. When we talk about awareness, we're really talking about a sales funnel. And when we talk about a sales funnel, we're talking about how do we bring people to this place where they can find the solution that we've created. And all sales funnels have to do this kind of thing for us. You know, there's an awareness element that garners interest and it's from awareness to interest to consideration and evaluation. So you go across the funnel to read um, the stages of the funnel. But, but, but our funnel, and we help people to develop a, their own customized funnel based on their industry, could look like something when I had, one of my companies was an online company. And it was about how do I bring qualified eyeballs to my site? How do I, you know, what, what, what is the population, the size of the sale? So how do I get them to populate a cart with lots of things? What's the conversion rate of the site? And what are my discounts and returns? When I understood that my business had those elements in their funnel, which were driven by this process of awareness, interest, consideration, evaluation, all the way down to advocacy, I began to develop specific strategies for each step of the process, beginning with awareness. And that awareness began with all kinds of things like you know, uh, you know, strategic partners, events, web-based solutions, you know, AdWords, uh, social media. Uh, even in social media alone, you're looking at things like, well, do I have a YouTube channel? Do I have, uh, is this a Reddit? Is this a, a LinkedIn? Is it, is it Facebook? What or a combination of those that I would have a presence that my potential client might be looking routinely at for my solution? And then how do I do that in a way that compels them. And then the very last, the last three questions are talking about how we speak to them. So we'll get to that in a moment. But know that part of my success is understanding whatever strategies I'm using to make people aware of my solution, I need to measure the efficacy of those of those strategies and find out if 14% of the people are coming from direct contact, what's the cost of that direct contact? If 30 people are coming from events, how many events are there available to me? And what, what is the cost to be present at that event to get that, that client? The most expensive element of your relationship with your client is the acquisition of the client. And so knowing where they come from and what it costs to bring them on board so that they actually try, buy, and repeat, refer us in that process is important. And then when I get to the funnel, what is the transition between each of those stages from awareness to confidence to try by repeat refer or from in this case awareness to appointment and appointment to discovery and discovery to to proposal and proposal to close right um, whatever your business is it has a unique funnel and getting to know what your funnel is really matters so the awareness piece is going to be there's a there's a science to it right and that's just a numbers game. How many people can I become aware of that might transition to each stage? And at some point that funnel is, is angled for a reason. We lose people along the way. <clears throat> but what are constant things that we would do? So that awareness, again, it's its own thing. But well, then how do I go to that next step? Get, get confidence in my brand, whether it's endorsement or consumer reviews or endorsement by experts, or you become recognized as an expert. Again, those four are not the only ways to gain confidence, but do know that your consumer is following the same consumer pattern that you did, which is if I buy something online, there, there's a certain number of reviews that have to exist before I even give the reviews credence. And then when I, you know, it, then there has to be a certain number, you know, like it has to be above four out of five. And then I look at the ones. What are the consistent problems people have with this brand? But that's all part of the confidence strategy. And there's a lot to discuss here. And again, but you just need to be aware that you have to address that and address it deliberately and with intelligence. Uh, the, the science is that it has to happen. The art is how you do that with your solution. The next is how do you get them to actually try something? Get somebody to emotively depart with some portion of their, of their hard fought resources to give your solution a try. Um, and it could be, in this case, promotions. And how do you promote in a way that doesn't eat up all your margin? 
um, you know, people like Kellogg's give away free samples. It turns out only 3% of the people that receive those free samples of the mail bother to open them, even from a known brand like Kellogg. That's how wired we are to avoid the unknown. But again, here are some examples of ways to get people to try it. And then a completely different strategy to get them to, pot, to buy your product. Uh, and, and really at the heart of that is, is their pain greater than my price? Back to that pain price threshold that we talked about in that third question and the, the compelling value proposition. And, and it needs to be, it has to be that, that the pain is way greater than my price or people will not part with their cash. The other is, I put this down here, and that is really important to avoid the death spiral of discounting. Margin matters. It turns out that margin is the thing that allows us to make mistakes as business operators. And so there are entire strategies on how to preserve your margin on your goods and services. And then next is how do we get those people that have purchased us, experienced us, been pleased with us to buy more of what we offer? whether it's repeat orders or whether it's complimentary new products or new offerings entirely. It, it does matter that we have a strategy to, because again, the most expensive part of the relationship is bringing them on to, into the fold. Um, and then next is how do we get them to refer us to their circle of influence? First and foremost is be deliberate about that fact. Most, most businesses fail in the low hanging fruit here by not having a strategy for getting referrals from those that are satisfied customers. Um, what is it that we can do to, to arm them with the material to defend their, their decision to have purchased our product or experienced our service in a way that will allow them to become good advocates for our brand? And again, four bullet points, there are dozens and dozens of ways for us to go about getting referrals. First and foremost is to ask for them. And then once we've gone through those first nine questions, that we solve a problem, solve it uniquely with a compelling value proposition, that we get people to become aware of our solution, gain confidence in solution, try by repeat and refer us to their circle of influence. Now it's how do we get that, how do we speak to them? And we speak to them by identifying the problem, we amplify the problem, we resolve the problem. And I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. But know that <clears throat> that, that that is the science of how we go about messaging. Understand also that the message that we put together may be for more than one audience. It could be that Chad gets influenced by his buddies. Uh, let, let's take that sling, for example. You know, we've got the patient, Chad. But let's say we want to sell that through the medical community. Well, you've got to demonstrate its medical efficacy to a doctor if you want the doctor to refer this to them. If you're going to sell it in a hospital, then you've got the purchasing agent that needs to make sure there's margin there. You've got the hospital administrator that wants to make sure that, that they're mitigating risk and that they have something that not only has efficacy, but doesn't have any unintended consequences that might cause them to, to be sued, right? So each one of those four people, the Chad, the doctor, the purchasing agent, and the, and the hospital administrator all have a unique challenge that you've got to address in your messaging, amplify if they don't address it, what could happen, and then resolve it by saying, here's the solution to their problem. And know that all of our decisions, all of them, are um, typically made emotionally and defended logically. And so when we go about emo you know, appealing emotionally to people and, uh, and wanting them to be able to, to address the problem uh, because, you know, they've hurt themselves, that, that um, you know, we need to give them the ammunition to defend it as logically as possible. Uh, all of our decisions, every, the shirt I'm wearing, you know, the, the, the equipment that's around me, uh, we're all emotional purchases that we defend with logic behind why we would choose the camera, the microphone, the, the lighting, et cetera, to put on something like a webinar. Likewise, Chad's going through that same process, right? So in this case, if, if you're going to hand him that, that sling, you've got to share with him all the reasons why that sling makes sense. And in the context of a, a unique problem, a problem that's unique with a compelling value proposition, um, this is how all of this comes together. So as we contemplate, you know, again, an economy skidding sideways, we have to ask ourselves, is the problem we're solving still relevant in the market? 
are we solving it in a unique way that differentiates us from a very aggressive competitive landscape? Uh, when, when things are, are going well, competitive landscapes aren't necessarily as draconian as they become when purchases become more scarce. And during an economic downturn, that's one of the symptoms that we're in an economic downturn is that purchases become more scarce. And so having a value proposition that's compelling to the audience for which you have a solution matters. Creating awareness. Every single time that you make people aware of your brand, it costs you money. And so you want to make sure that you spend that money as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Gaining confidence is a strategy. And there are tons and tons of things we can do in that process to help people gain confidence in our brand, to try it, to buy it, to repeat the process and to refer us into our circle of influence. And then again, identifying the problem, amplifying the problem, resolve the problem. You know, you know Chad, you brought, you, you've you damaged your arm. Yeah, I have. Um, okay, I've identified the problem. And, and now there's this dull ache in your shoulder. Yeah, there's a dull ache in my shoulder. Would it, would it hurt if I bumped your arm? Uh, yeah, when, please. That's amplifying. What if I moved your arm? Again, amplifying the problem. Well, here's here's my solution. Here's this great uh, sling. And there's that aha moment that only moves into a purchase if the pain is greater than the price. And those are examples, again, of 12 questions that you should be answering, not just now, but you should be answering quarterly, semi-annually, annually, to make sure that the competitive landscape hasn't uh, begun to occupy space that you thought you occupied by yourself. So those are, if, if you'd like to learn more about, and again, I feel like we've just skipped the rock across the river here. Um, if you if you like a deep dive, then this is the place to go. Uh, you would go here and, and do a QR code. I'll give you about five seconds to pull out your smartphone and, and do a quick um, snapshot. Uh, if you'd like to get a personal response, um, then David King is the guy. Uh, and, and for that, uh, here's his QR code. And uh, David, you, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, and, and to echo what, what Wynn just shared, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today, especially for saying that Volvo is the safest car on the road. That's <laughs> We all know it's the case, including... Those, yeah. those times that I sat in the back seat and faced backwards, somehow that was that was the safest thing to do in the car at the time. But yeah. to, to that extent, motion sickness and sitting forward, which, which I'm fair enough. It was fun as a kid, though. So I, I enjoyed that. But um, like Wynn said, if if you enjoyed this discussion on marketing and revenue growth and want to continue the conversation and and answer those those 12 questions for your own business, then please reach out to me directly using the information on the screen right now. Um, it's a simple click with the smartphone and that QR code or follow that URL there. Um, additionally, in the next few days, we're going to share this content as a, as a recorded presentation. Um, and with that, there will also be a survey link that accompanies it. Um, and in the efforts of our own continuous improvement um, and, and our interest to get better every day, please use that as an opportunity to share what you like and, and what you think we can improve on. Uh, we are at 1130 win, so I want to honor those with time commitments at this hour um, and and those who can hang around, I've got a couple of extra questions for you, Wynn, to, to get some, some of your perspective and dive a little bit deeper into one of those topics. Um, so if, if anyone is willing to wait, please feel free to hang on, but if not, um, thank you again for joining us. So with that, uh, Wynn, I'll, I'll, I'll slide us into overtime. And, okay. uh, and, I, and I wanna ask you, um, as you're talking about providing a solution that that adds value to the customer, um, how how do you how do you come to the understanding of what the market really wants? Oh, great question, and and that's one of the questions in the chat. So um, yeah, so the the, uh, the thing that comes to my mind was a, a really powerful lesson I learned watching Apple, uh, a company I have a lot of respect for, and what Apple did is. For, for those of us of a certain age, they came out with the iPod years and years ago. And as any you know, intelligent business would, they did a lot of market research. And they researched 18 colors of which they came to nine that they went to market with. And, and, and they, did, they brought a bunch of people in. They surveyed them of the 18 colors that they wanted to build these things in brushed aluminum. They were, you know, it was purple and blue and orange and green and yellow and red. And I mean, it was 
some really gorgeous colors. They came out, as I mentioned, to market with nine and they sold four of them. And they were perplexed because they had invested a considerable amount of money in this inventory and they sold, you know, white and silver and black and red. And they were like, what about the blue and the pink and the yellow and the, and the, and the, and the green that everybody said they wanted? Uh, and so they, they were perplexed trying to figure out why the consumer said one thing and did another. And so what they did is they, they, they mixed it up. They hired a, a, a social anthropologist to conduct market research. And he chose to do the exact same thing. He brought everybody in, put out the 18 colors. They chose the same nine. But instead of giving them the $50 at the end of, the, of their participation, he said, you can either have the $50 or we'll give you one of these iPads or iPods. And they took the iPod and sure enough, they were taking those four colors, one of the four colors. And then he, the mix up, the, the adding to it was at the end of it saying, hey, you chose these colors. You're walking out with silver, which wasn't one of the top three. Why is that? And they revealed to him that, you know, though they identify with the with the purple and the green and the yellow and the pink, they didn't have the the, the quotes range from we don't I don't have the courage to wear that. It's, it's you know it's a little bit too much. Uh, I'm a little more stated. You know that's kind of my persona. That's not that's not who I am publicly. That's who I am privately. Uh, the other was it doesn't match most of what I own, so I go with something kind of neutral. And and they got really smart about that, and that influenced me. Uh, at, at, at a period audio, we had 12 different colors of speakers. And sure enough, like Apple, we sold two. We sold the, sold the cherry wood finish, real cherry wood and black. And the rest of it didn't sell very much. And so I applied that same wisdom that I learned from Apple to the colors of the speakers that we offered. And it dramatically reduced the, the, the amount of money I had tied up in really non-moving inventory. And that again, operationally, was an important thing for me to learn. Interesting. Well, thank you for the explanation there. I know myself, I like the color of the blue iPod, but I can tell you I had the silver iPod. Yeah, and exactly. There's, yeah. there's probably something something about that to do with it, right? Right, exactly. Um, I, Wayne, I want to I wanna ask you one more question before we wrap up today. Um, and, and this was again, you know, we, we skipped the rock over the surface here, but, but this one's very important. And I, I think probably a lot of business leaders as they're looking at, at sales potentially decreasing, they're considering, you know, do I, do I throw a discount on the top of my sales? Um, what, what advice or, or uh, expertise could you share with regard or with regards to a discount on your, on your services or your product? Yeah, absolutely. So um, back to the audio company, you know, we were direct to consumer and the whole business model was that I could sell you the, you know, I could sell you a Lexus for the price of a Toyota because we cut out the middleman. So the model itself provided value. And, and if I discounted my product, then I was undercutting the whole notion of the value I was offering with through the model. But there are ways to add value so that people are compelled to buy without discounting margin. And margin really matters. I mean, it is, like I said earlier on, David, it's what allows us as business operators to make mistakes. The, the greater the margin, the more mistakes we can make. And what comes to mind is, um, you know, the very first airplane that the, that the Army Air Corps purchased in 1915 took off the ground at 40 miles an hour and, and had a top speed of 44 miles an hour. So that means that its flight envelope was four miles an hour. And if they turned too hard, then you were converting some of that lift into bank. And in doing so, you'd fall out of the air. So you had to turn really slowly. Uh, the planes that I learned how to fly in uh, took off at 45 miles an hour and flew at 90 miles an hour. So that envelope of, that allowed me as a young pilot to make a lot of mistakes learning how to fly planes is an analogy to what margin is to me as a business owner. Boy, margin matters. And so the discounting death spiral, which is what I put down there, you know, if, if you discount your product 10%, you've got a 50% margin and regular keystone pricing, you got to sell two and a half times more in order to make up for that difference and on 10% margin and a 10% discount. If you discount 20%, the, the numbers get exponentially higher, where at 25%, you have to, you have to sell considerably more product to get the same um, revenue through the door that allows you to pay, you know, gross margin uh, to pay for your fixed and variable expenses. And so 
one of the things that we do help businesses do is to identify how they can enhance the value of their offering fundamentally and then tangentially so that they preserve their margin and increase their margin so that they can make mistakes, which we all do, and recover from them. Tremendous. Okay. Thank you for sharing that that little uh, anecdote with the with the airplanes as well as the professional advice. And and when is correct? If if anyone on the call uh, or the recording is is interested in diving into this deeper, these are conversations that we have regularly with clients. So please reach out uh, if we can be of any service to you on the call. With that, when I'm gonna I'm gonna close our overtime and and wrap things up for today. But thank you for joining us, um, and and thank you for your presentation today. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yep. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.